Welcome to SAB. Uh, and this section is going to be the first section for ethnobotany. And we'll be trying to build up on what the plenary speaker uh, gave out yesterday of NY. So in this section, we'll be having six speakers that will be speaking. They all have 20 minutes each, 15 minutes for the question, and five, uh, 15 minutes for the presentation, and five minutes for question. I will ask us to be very interactive, especially the participants. We have uh, the Q and A for you to put your questions, even suggestion. The reason being that some of the presenters are students and they will actually appreciate feedback on how to improve their research. So for this section, I'll be starting with uh, the first speaker, who is Dr. Tomi Adetunji, who is one of, uh, is a postdoctoral student in Northwest University. She will be speaking to us about uh, phytochemical antioxidants and functional group of the South African plant. Dr. Adetunji, welcome. Please take note, you have 20 minutes, which is 15 minutes for your presentation and five minutes for question. I will kindly remind you if you are going over time. The floor is yours and all the best with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And um, I just want to confirm if you can see my screen. Hello. Yes, we can see it. You can proceed, Dr. Okay. Adetunji. Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tommy Adetunji, and um, the title of my presentation is Phytochemical Antioxidant and Functional Group Analysis of South African Evovolos Asinoides. In the course of my presentation, I will be guided by the following outline introduction. Among the various life forms of plants, forbs, Forbs are long, grassy, herbaceous flowering plants. They are often regarded as weeds and are treated as turf that gets in the way of grasses. As a result of this, there's limited research and knowledge on the role of forbs. However, a number of indigenous forb species are consumed as vegetables and they form a part of local people's diet. In fact, they are economically useful crops that had bolstered food security historically when the main crops failed. In addition, many of the four species are used in traditional medicine to treat different ailments. Because of the broad range of bioactive phytochemicals present in some of these four species that can be potentially employed for the treatment and prevention of several diseases in modern medicine. In our lab, that is a um, for ecology research group of the Northwest University. Previous studies have um, indicated, have reported that members of, of the convolvulus um, family in particular, they are highly nutritional folks and they have high medicinal properties for human and animals. So currently there's much research focus on this group of plants that is four species in the family convolvulus Convolvulaceae for their nutritional and medicinal properties that has really been investigated before. Evovulus asinoides, which is a species of interest to me in my presentation today, is a forb, it is a medicinal forb in the family Convolvulaceae. This forb is distributed throughout the tropical and subtropical regions of the world, and in South Africa, it is distributed in the Alten, KwaZulu Nata, Limpopo, Mpumalanga. Northern Cape and the Northwest provinces. The image of the plant is shown on the screen. Although it is a small plant, it is about 0.2 to 0.6 meter in height. It has big impact as it provides important food resources for African game species. And it also possess important medicinal properties. For ages, Ebobulus asinoides has been used in various form in traditional medicine. And this plant holds high significance in India Ayurvedic medicine, and it is known as Shankapupsi. This name comes from its intellect, rejuvenating, and cognitive potentiating activities. In fact, it is considered as one of the best four brain tonics in India. From a pharmacological point of view, Evovolus asinoides is used as a neuroprotective, anti amnesic antidepressant, immunomodulatory, antioxidant, among other properties. 
However, even though this plant is widely distributed in South Africa, there are no studies on its nutritional, phytochemical, antioxidants, and functional group that may be responsible for the bar activities of Evovulus arsenoides collected from South Africa. In fact, from literature search, there are no reports on the nutritional constituents of this plant. However, another member of our lab has um, investigated these activities and she will be presenting this in another ethnomedicine session in this conference. So you can look forward to it. Phytochemical investigations of medicinal plants are logical in discovering new bioactive secondary metabolites that can be explored further for to produce novel therapeutic drugs. In view of this, the present study aimed to analyze the phytochemical contents, antioxidant activities, as well as the functional groups present in South Africa, Evovulus, Asinoides, to discover its bioactive secondary metabolites and for its broad spectrum usage methods. The area part of Evovulus Asinoides was collected at Palaboa in the Lipompo province of South Africa. And the plant was identified at the AP Gusin Abirium of the Northwest University. The plant was washed, air dried, and pulverized. Extraction was done with two solvents, the water and um, distilled water and ethanol. Extraction was done with these two solvents since the most widely used solvents for herbal preparations in traditional medicine are water and ethanol, or the combination of both. These two solvents are also considered less toxic than other organic solvents. After extraction, the crude extracts were analyzed for phytochemical content, and the phytochemical analyzed in this plant included the total phenolic content, it's coded as TPC on the screen, the total flavonoid content, the pro-anthocyanidine, PRO, alkaloid, and saponin. And for the antioxidant capacity, three antioxidant acids were used, which included the DPPH, the ABTS, and the FRAP. For the DPPH and the ABTS, um, BHT, that's butylated hydrotoluene, was used as the reference antioxidant. And for the FRAP acid, Trolox was used as the reference antioxidant. The analysis of phytochemical constituents and antioxidant activities followed standard protocols. Also, piercing correlation coefficient analysis was used to establish the relationship between the phenolic phytochemicals and antioxidant activities of the extract. And lastly, the functional groups present in the extract were analyzed using Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy. Result and discussion. After extraction, the, the aqueous extract of Evovulus asinoides gave a percentage yield of 18.95, and the ethanol extract gave a percentage yield of 7.94. So for to obtain high extraction yield of this plant, water is recommended as the optimal solvent. In the phytochemical analysis, the aqueous and ethanolic extracts of Evovulus asinoides showed considerable amounts of secondary metabolites, which included alkaloids, phenols, flavonoids, pro and saponins. However, the aqueous, the ethanol extract rather, are the highest concentrations of the various phytochemicals analyzed. This is displayed on the screen. For the total phenol content, the aqueous extract gave a, a value of 13.39 milligram gallic acid equivalent per gram of extract, while the ethanol gave a value of 17.07 milligram gallic acid equivalent per gram of extract. And for the flavonoid, this is a value of the aqueous extract, 47.80, while the ethanol extract gave a value of 82.44 um, milligram casetine equivalent per gram of extract. And in the pro anthocyanidine the aqueous extract gave a value of 31.58, while the ethanol extract gave a value of 32.98 milligram catechine equivalent per gram of extract. The total alkaloid and saponin quantification of the crude extract of Evovulus asinoides gave me percentage values of 2.6 and 33.7, respectively, for alkaloid and saponin. The high concentration of phenolic phytochemicals in the ethanolic extract of Evovulus asinoides may be attributed to the higher solubility of phenolics in organic solvents. 
Such higher concentrations of phenolic phytochemicals in organic extracts has been reported in previous studies. The phytochemicals obtained in, in this study possess valuable pharmaceutical properties. For example, phenolic phytochemicals, which is a total um, phenol, flavonoid, and proanthocyanidin analyzed in this study, they are potent antioxidants. Alkaloids also possess excellent pharmaceutical actions. For example, morphine is an alkaloid and it is used as an analgesic. Quinine is another alkaloid that is used as an anti-malaria. In addition, saponins have excellent cholesterol lowering functions in addition to other pharmaceutical properties. So we can say that the presence of the phytochemicals in evovolus arsenoides extract may be responsible for some of the reported biological effects in this plant. The result of the antioxidant activity is shown on the screen. The antioxidant activity of the extract of evovolus arsenoides were evaluated using three in vitro assays, that is the DPPH, EBTS, and FRAP, because of the diverse mechanism of action by which antioxidants scavenge free radicals. The radical scavenging capacities of aqueous and ethanolic extracts of these plants, as determined in the DPPH and ABTS assay, increase with their concentration. This implies that as the concentration of the extract in increases, the ability to scavenge um, free radicals also increases. However, in the IC50 calculated, we can see that the BHT, that's the standard antioxidant use, add the highest. Um, gave the best scavenging activity because it had the lowest IC50 values. The higher the IC50 value, the lower the antioxidant activity of the extract. However, when we compare the ethanolic and the aqueous extract, the ethanolic extract displayed higher antioxidant activity than those of aqueous extract in the three assays. And this higher activity, the, this higher antioxidant activity in the ethanolic extract of the vulvulus seem to be related to its higher phenolic phytochemical content. It is well known that an imbalance between the production of reactive oxygen species in the body and the ability of the body to detoxify this oxidative product results in oxidative stress. And oxidative stress has been implicated in the etiology of several chronic diseases such as cancer and cardiovascular diseases. And prolonged use of synthetic antioxidants like BHT has been linked to negative health effects. So natural sources of antioxidants that can fight the negative health effects of oxidative stress are very important. From the study, we can say that evovolus arsenoides can serve as potential antioxidant agents for further drug development. I also mentioned earlier that this plant is used as a neuroprotective agent, traditionally and even in modern medicine. So the antioxidant activity of Evovolus arsenoides extract supports the neuroprotective action of the plant, with likely underlying mechanism being free radicals scavenging and antioxidant action on the brain cells. In the correlation analysis done, the result is shown here. The phenolic phytochemicals exhibited strong positive correlations with DPPH and the ABTS assay. You can see, sorry, the DPPH and ABTS antioxidant assays. However, in the FRAP assay, only the flavonoid content showed a perfect and significant correlation with the antioxidant activity of Evovolus arsenoides only in the ethanolic extract. This result suggests that flavonoids are the major phytochemicals influencing maximum antioxidant activity in the FRAP assay. This is the FTIR spectra of evovolus arsenoides for the aqueous extract and also for the ethanolic extract. The infrared spectra of the extracts were similar and revealed the presence of characteristic functional groups of carboxylic acids, aromatic amines, alkenes, phenols, alkynes, hydrosy, and alcohol. The detailed characteristics of the FTR spectra of the extract, the aqueous and the ethanolic extract of this plant is shown here. The presence of functional or these functional groups in the extract could account for the various biological effects of evovolus arsenoides as well as its uses in traditional medicine. 
From this study, I'm now on the conclusion and recommendation. The study has revealed that the ethanolic extract of Evovulus acenoides had higher phytochemical content and antioxidant activities than the aqueous extract. These differences observed in the antioxidant activity may be due to the higher phenolic phytochemicals in the ethanolic extract, which influences antioxidant and scavenging activities. It is well known that um, phenolic phytochemicals are the largest group of um, antioxidant secondary metabolites in plants. Also, the study showed a strong positive correlation between the phenolic phytochemicals and the antioxidant activities of the extract in the DPPH and ABTS assay. In addition, the FTIR analysis confirmed the presence of several functional groups in the extract, which could actually account for the various biological effects of the plant. Overall, we can conclude that Ibovulus acenoides contains bioactive pharmaceutical components, which justify its use in folkloric medicine. It is, however, recommended that further studies should focus on the identification and isolation of individual phytochemical components in Evovulus acenoides, as well as in vivo studies for its broad spectrum usage. These are my references. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much. Oh, so the floor is now open for comment for our uh, questions for Dr. Adetunji. While we are waiting, I just want to set the ball rolling. Dr. Adetunji, you talked about the memory enhancing effect of this lab plan. Is there any particular ethnic group within South Africa? And is it unique to South Africa or there are other related studies in other parts of Africa? Now, actually, if for the, this, yeah. yeah, for the memory enhancing effect, it is majorly used in India. I've not seen any reports where it's using um, South Africa for its memory enhancing um, effect, but with our results, it's, we are trying to communicate the findings of our results. And when we do much um, studies on this and we can establish that, then it will be published and people can um, use this as um, a, um, a memory enhancing plant. Okay. But is there any use beside memory in South yeah. Africa? Yeah. What are they use this? Yeah, it is it is used to treat diabetes. It is also used for um for um sorry diabetes as an um another traditional use of this plant is for dysentery also in South Africa. Okay. No, thank you. The reason I'm asking is that perhaps I'm sure you've got other plans. This is just the first phase. Yes. If there are other uses, like you talked about the area, that means it might have antibacteria. So those are the areas you can also explore going forward. Okay, Another so suggestion I'll have for you is that you've used two solvents only. Yes, and sir. they are both polar uh, solvents. So you might miss something. So it's always good if there is resources and time you're not using things like exen and co you might have missed one or two things so just take note of that if there are resources for you to pursue it along that angle okay, so. and the other issue is that if you can also do more uh analytical work because what you've used are just preliminary in nature so that you can actually quantify what is there isolation is always a very very difficult route so yeah, that might always not give you a result. But if you can profile the plant, issue about seeding and stuff are other issues you can look at in terms of the uh, this particular project. Let me go back to the audience. I can't find any questions so far. I think everything is clear and thank you so much. Uh, and all the best with your research. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Adetunji. So, we will be going to the second speaker. The second speaker is uh, Rashid Adeyemo, who is from Prof. Lindy Margot's lab in University of Victoria. So the floor is yours. We are looking forward to what you'll be telling us about plants used for diarrhea. I'm sure this is part of your postgraduate study. So you also entered for the student competition. So keep to time because the assessors are online to assess you. 
the floor is yours, uh, Mr. Rashid. Thank you, Prof. Can you see my screen? Hello, it's, Prof. We can't see your screen yet. Oh. I'm trying to... Windows. I'm trying to share my screen. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's here. Can you see my screen now? Not yet. Okay, it's coming up. Yes, we can see it. Mr. Rashid, you can proceed. Good day, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to present to you um, part of my PhD work titled um, Antibiotic, Antioxidant, and Anti Inflammatory Activities of Selected Indigenous South African Plants Used in the Treatment of Diarrhea. This is the synopsis of my presentation. Um, Selective pressure over the years. Selective pressure on bacteria over the years has given rise to numerous um, strategies for their survival in different environmental niches. One of the numerous strategies is biofilm, which is a complex structure formed when bacteria colonies group together within an extracellular matrix, providing protection and aiding their development. The use of plants as therapy is one of the oldest folklore practiced till date. Empirical evidence has shown that plants undisputedly possess biologically active components used in the treatment of different medical conditions such as diarrhea. Mechanism of antibiotic activity include the inhibition of polymer matrix, repression of cell attachment and adhesion, interruption of extracellular matrix generation, and blocking of quorum sensing network. Antibiotic agent has been previous, previously extracted from plants such as Coptis, Chinesis, and garlic, as seen in the work of Lou et al. 2019. The aims and objective of this study is to evaluate the antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, and antibiotic activity of the selected plants. We hypothesize that the selected plants possess good antioxidants, anti-inflammatory, and antibiotic activities. Methodology. Plants were carefully selected based on previous work done in phytomedicine units. Plant collection was done from um, Nesproit Botanical Garden in Pumalanga province. Plants uh, vouchers were deposited at University of Pretoria Herbarium for identification. Plant leaves were grounded and into powdered form and extracted with acetone. Biological evaluation was done based on uh, to, to, uh, to evaluate the antioxidants using ABTS and DPPH in vitro pathways. Uh, nitric oxide production in lipopolysaccharide activated raw macrophage cells and 15 lipoxygenase inhibitory assay to evaluate the anti-inflammatory activity of the selected plants. Crystal bioless staining method of Sandasi et al. 2011 was deployed to evaluate the antibiofilm activity of the selected plants. Graph pad prism version 6 was used for data analysis using one-way analysis of variance and Turkey's post hoc tests. Table 1 shows the plants used for this study Siasia pendulina, Siasia leptodicta, Siasia batophila, Siasia lancea, all belong to the family Anacardiaceae. Also, Bioina galpini and Bioina bocri that belong to uh, the family Fabaceae. This is the pictures of some of the plants used Bioina bocri and Siasia pendulina results and discussion. Figure one shows the free radical scavenging activity of acetone plant extracts. 
And for my left hand side, which shows the ABTS um, IC50 values, it was observed that there was no significant difference between the IC50 values of trolos and ascorbic acid. And also there were no significant difference between Siasia lancea and Siasia batophila when compared with trolos and ascorbic acid. In this case, trolos and ascorbic acid were used as positive control. So based on the statistical analysis, um, we, we, it is safe to say that Siasia lancea and Siasia batophila were as good as trolos and ascorbic acid statistically. Siasia pendulina, Siasia leptodicta, Baina galpini, and Baina buckley those possess significant difference in their ICVT value when compared with trolos and ascorbic acid and Siasia lancea and Siasia batophila. From my right hand side, which is the DPPH, there was no significant difference between the trolox and ascorbic acid, um, no significant difference between Pauina bulkry and trolox and ascorbic acid. However, um, there was significant difference between the IC50 values of Siasia pendulina, Siasia leptodicta, Siasia lancea, and Siasia batophila when compared with Pauina bulkry, trolox, and ascorbic acid. So it is safe to say that. Baina bulkry is as good as trolox and ascorbic acid based on the statistical value. Figure two shows the 15 lipoxygenase inhibitory activity of acetone plant extract. And from this figure, um, Siasia batophila, there was no significant difference between the IC50 value of Siasia batophila and quercetin, which is the positive control. However, there was significant difference between the values of Siasia pendulina, Siasia leptodicta, Siasia lancea, Baina galpini, and Baina bulkley when compared with Batophila and Quercetin. So it is suggesting that Siasia Batophila could be as good as Quercetin in terms of the, the LOX activity. Table two shows the nitric oxide inhibition activity of the selected plant. And from here, Siasia batophila gave the highest percentage of nitric oxide inhibition of 74.79, followed by Siasia lancea of 64.23%, and closely followed by Siasia pendulina with 63.44%. However, looking at the raw cell viability, it is observed that in Siasia batophila, there was enhancement of cell viability of about 101.67%, which is in contrary to what is observed in Siasia pendulina of 16.50. This shows that this is suggesting to us that the nitric oxide inhibition in Siasia pendulina might be as a result of cell death. Table 3 shows the antibiotic activity of acetone plant extract against Escherichia coli ATCC25922. From here, at zero hour inhibition, all the plants were observed to have good antibiotic activity with their values greater than 50%. At 24 hour inhibition, only Siasia pendulina had poor antibiotic activity with a value less than 50. However, at 48 hour inhibition, there was none of the plants with antibiotic activity. In conclusion, Siasia batophila are the best antioxidant and anti-inflammatory activities. All the plant extracts add good biofilm formation, inhibition activity, and as well as um, with their values greater than that of gentamicin. However, all the tested plants had no bathroom destruction ability. Further study is therefore necessary to elucidate and identify the compounds that could be responsible for the observed activities in the tested plant extract. My profound gratitude goes to my supervisor, Professor Lindy McGough, the entire staff and student of Phytomedicine, University of Pretoria, for providing the ambience to carry out this research work. National Research Foundation for the Funds. These are some of the references that I quoted in this work. Thank you for taking your time to listening 
to this presentation. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Mr. Rashid, uh, that was a good presentation and very informative. Thank you. And we have so much time. We have more than 10 minutes left. So I'll call on the audience. If there is one or two contribution, comment or suggestion to the candidate as is a postgraduate student. I think I can find a question. Any question from the audience? While we are waiting for questions, can you tell me why acetone? Uh, thank you, Prof. We, we, we started with about five solvents. We tried water, we tried ethanol, we tried methanol. We try dichloromethane and um, uh, another solvent. But acetone gave us the best of the activity in terms of the antibacterial activity. So that was why we had to proceed with um, uh, acetone extract. So we, we try like six different solvents. OK, so it was based on your initial screening that you yes. went for acetone. OK. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Just to follow up again, where do you see this being applicable? Is it for animal health? Is it for crop protection? Is it for human health? And what are the practical implications of well, your findings? Oh, thank you, Prof. It, it could be useful for both um, animal care um, um, aspects as well as human because diarrhea, our target is diarrhea. So this could be, uh, diarrhea is affected by it affects both man and animal so it could be very useful in both animal health and human health okay uh the floor is still open to more questions and suggestions to the candidates so are you doing your master's or phd it's phd okay i have a question here uh okay. from Mama Kony, she's asking that there was no antibiofilm activity after 48 hours. That what are yeah. the what what can be responsible? What are the possible reasons for this observation after 48 hours? Uh, it, it be, okay, it could be that um, the the biofilm form um, uh, did not allow uh, the plant solvent to get uh, the plant extract to get into into the um, matrix. So once um, the antibiotic agent is not able to gain access into the formed matrix, it might not be able to do anything to them. So probably the, at 48 hours, the matrix form was so formidable to the extent that the, the crude extract could not affect uh, their well-being. Okay, no, thank you so much. I missed Prof Motete's question. Now we'll go back to it. Prof Motete is okay. asking you that what influenced uh, your choice of those plants? What were the factors you looked at? How did you come about those plants? Was it based on their family type or availability or what? Can you just give us some details on what influenced your choice? Uh, first, these plants were plants used uh, for treatment of diarrhea locally in South Africa. So that formed the basis. And we have done a lot of, a lot of work has been done in phytomedicine units. So based on our previous work, we selected these six to, to forge ahead to knowing, um, the, to do further studies on them. Okay, any particular ethnic group? Because most of this knowledge are from different groups. So it's always good if we know is it used by the Zulus? Is it used in free state? Do you have that information? You no, don't no, have no. to. No, no. Oh, okay. I don't have so that. That's information. something you need to look at so that you can okay. actually justify. The reason okay. I'm also saying this is that in terms of intellectual property, okay. I think this one aspect which Prof. Ben spoke about yesterday, okay. that most of this thing need to be attributed back to the knowledge holders. So yeah. please take care of that, especially mm -hmm. at PhD level. You okay. need that information in your introduction and yeah. uh, literature review yeah, to acknowledge the knowledge of us. I think we've done so much and so much questions for you. Thank you so much, Mr. Rashid, and all the best with your research. Yeah, thank um, you so much, Prof. It's okay. my pleasure. Okay. Bye.
Okay, thank you so much. And thanks to the audience for making this section to be interactive. Now I'll be going to Ms. Bota, who is from University of Victoria. This is actually a different dimension because she is looking at some molecular identification, not just the biological activity. Ms. Bota, are you on? Hi, yes, I'm here. Okay, welcome. And we are all yours. You have 20 minutes, 15 minutes for the presentation. I will engage you with uh, in five minutes. Thank you, that's fine. Okay. Is, um, is my screen visible? Yes. We can okay, see great. Okay. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to my presentation. Um, I worked on a project titled The Molecular Identification of Medicinally Important Grass Species, an Investigation of a Wide Variance Antitrocinase Activity. Um, Prof. Berger was my supervisor, and Prof. Lal and Dr. Lukana were my co-supervisors. So we worked on these beautiful endemic plants that shows promising um, medicinal activity against hyperpigmentation. And they're shrubby or tree-like with these striking red or, in some, ca some cases, white flowers. So we have three species in the genus. We have the rattle colfrey, the Sutherlandi, and the Flanagani. So there's possible overlap um, or there's morphological overlap and possible hybridization happening between the rattle colfrey and the Sutherlandi. And I think this is quite a big problem, especially since these are medicinal plants, so we need to accurately identify them to prevent adulteration. So um, the Greya rattle colfrey is known for having these woolly leaves and compact inflorescence, while the Sutherlandi should have these longer inflorescence with glabrous leaves, and then the Flanagani looks completely different by having hanging flowers and smooth leaves. So if we look at the pictures, the first should be a rattle colfrey, the second should be a Sutherlandi, and the last picture is clearly a, a Flanagani. So in this study, where we obtained all of our plant material from three locations that I've indicated here. We had plants from Pretoria, um, and then we had plants from, from Kohuk in Pumalanga and from Urugstad Nature Reserve which some of which were the same as the plants from Pretoria, but I'll get, I'll make that clear in a minute. All of the plants that we investigated, both the white and the wild types came from these locations. So I had three research questions and the first deals with comparing the morphology based identification with the molecular identification. And we also wanted to see if there's any hybrids present. Then we also had a question about the genome size of the grape plants and perhaps if there is a significant size difference between the species. And lastly, we also wanted to compare the medicinal activity of white flower grape variants um, to the wild type red flower plants. So while the study involved more plants, we especially wanted to focus on identifying the um, white flower variants that some of which are growing in the UP nursery um, at the University of Pretoria, and these um, plants originally came from Werachstadt Nature Reserve. So there's also a wild white flower tree growing in Pumalanga, which is the picture on the right hand side. So for our molecular identification, we use DNA barcoding and we specifically um, use the internal transcribed spacer region. So we use this region because there were very few barcoding genes. Um, of the GRAIA published on GenBank, but there were ITS sequences from two different sources, from UCT and from Germany. Um, unlike the other barcoding genes, the ITS can distinguish between all three species, um, and it is also a nuclear gene, so it's able to distinguish hybrids, which were essential for our study. So here we have the diagnostic single nucleotide polymorphisms of the three species. And as we can see, there are three positions where the three species differ, with a single SNP difference between the rattle colfrey and the Sutherlandi at position 403. And this is also the um, hybrid SNP. So I have to put in a disclaimer here that using the ITS to identify species can sometimes be misleading because it is a multi-copy region. But for our purposes, we defined hybrids as plants that were heterozygous for the ITS allele at certain single nucleotide polymorphisms 
while pure species were homozygous. So here in the picture, we see a homozygous pure rail colfery. And then here we have two hybrid plants that had double peaks. So we can see the first one has a higher C peak showing up as Sutherlandi on chain bank, while the second has a higher T peak showing up as Rattle Colfery on chain bank. Then we have a nearly perfect situation here as well, where the two peaks are almost an equal height. So um, logically, this would mean 50% of its ITAs came from the maternal parent and 50% came from the paternal parent. And our leading hypothesis for these different ratios is that concerted evolution of the ITS region is happening. And this is also why it can be misleading to use this region. It's interesting to note that the hybrids inflorescence resemble that which have been reported for um, Sutherlandis. Here we have the results of the white flower variants. And as we can see, the white flower plants from the nursery, so what, which originally came from Urugstad, looks like a pure gray rattle colfery, like the wild type next to it, if we look at the snips. And then here we have the other wild growing white flower plant in Pumalanga, which looks like a hybrid. So this is interesting because these two white flower plants are distinguishable on the DNA level, meaning that the mutation that causes the abolishment of pigment must have happened twice independently. Um, research question two dealt, dealt with the um, genome size of the plants, and we wanted to also determine if there's um, a size difference between the species as, a, as another possible means of species identification. But we could not fully answer the second part, though, because we couldn't identify pure Sutherlandi based on the ITS region in time. But preliminary results indicated that the Greya plants have a small genome. So we use flow cytometry to estimate the genome size of the grayer by comparing it to the known genome size of the standard. In this case, we used Oxalis articulata. Um, so here we have the flow cytometry histogram. And if we look at the x-axis visually, it looks like the grayer has a peak at 100, while the Oxalis has a peak at 200. So roughly, the grayer genome should be about half that of the Oxalis genome. And if we work it out more accurately, and the Oxalis genome is 0.91 picograms, the Greya genome works out to be about 0.48 picograms. Um, and I think that is quite interesting, but we do know that the um, genome sizes of angiosperms vary um, quite a bit from the 0.38 picogram genome of Arabidopsis to the 80 picogram genome of Lily of the Incas. So with regards to the genome size difference between the species, preliminary results indicated that a pure Flanagani and a pure Rattle Colfery did show a significant difference in their genome sizes, with the Rattle Colfery being sl slightly smaller than the Flanagani. Then on the medicinal side of things, the Greyas are being investigated for their potential application against hyperpigmentation. So this is when these darker melanin spots form on the skin, like we can see in the picture. So um, the main enzyme that we want to inhibit in the biosynthesis of melanin is the tyrosinase enzyme. And previous studies have isolated these two flavonoid compounds that show good tyrosinase inhibitory activity. So the lower the concentration, the better the compound's ability to inhibit the enzyme. So we looked at the inhibitory activity of some crude ethanolic leaf extracts. And the reason why we looked at the leaf extracts was because upon senescence, the red flower plants turn, the leaves turn this um, reddish purplish color, while the white flower plants uh, leaves only turn yellow. So we assume that the pigment is missing throughout the entire white flower plant. Um, the plants that I chose could be divided into two main groups. So we have plants from cultivation in Pretoria and also from their native environment in Pumalanga. So the red flower plant in Pretoria, um, the top graph in the, um, the bottom graph in the top picture, was this plant was growing in a shady spot, while the two plants from the wild received full sun. And as we can see, 
there's no significant difference in the IC50 values of the red and white flower plants growing in the wild, while the red flower plant growing in the shade in Pretoria had a significantly weaker inhibitory activity. So this is again indicated by a higher IC50 value. We also tested the medicinal activity of biological replicates of white flower plants that's growing in the nursery that were partially shaded and we found that it also showed good inhibitory activity with a lower IC50 value at around 60 micrograms per milliliter. So the amount of sunlight the tree receives may be one explanation for these differences in inhibitory activity. But if we compare the, the average IC50 values of the cultivated plants with the wild plants, we see that the wild plants have better inhibitory activity. So this may be due to um, the environments that the plants were growing in. Here we have the environmental conditions of the plants that's growing in Pretoria. And here we have the environmental conditions of plants that's growing in Pumalanga. So we can see that the average temperature where the plants with the high activity um, were growing was more than four degrees colder. And these plants were also growing at an altitude of 440 meters higher um, than the cultivated plants. So these environmental factors could also um, possibly explain the differences in the medicinal properties. So um, the study concluded that morphology-based identification is not sufficient to distinguish between the closely related Grey Sutherlandi and Grey Rattle Colfery. And in addition, um, preliminary results indicated that the grower plants have a small genome and that there is a statistically significant genome size difference between the Flanagani and the Rattle Colfery. And then uh, we also concluded that the medicinal properties are rather influenced by the environment than the abolishment of pigment. So in future, we should use a, a more accurate way of identifying the species, either using multiple um, barcoding genes or something like genome skimming or RADSeq. We should also increase our sample size for the flow cytometry so that we can have a better idea about the genome size of the plants before we do something like genome sequencing. We should also make artificial hybrids and see if the offspring is viable and what the ITS profiles of these offspring would look like. And I think we should also focus on testing the medicinal properties of the plants that's growing in different environments at temperatures, UV light and altitude. And another interesting study um, would be to look at the molecular and biochemical basis of white flower variants. Um, then I just want to say thank you to Prof Berger, Prof Lal and Dr. Rakana, um, and also to Dr. Uberlander and Ms. Sine for helping out with the flow cytometry using the instrument in the HGWK Schivert herbarium, and to Mr. Frisbee and Mr. Sampson for looking after the grey plants. And um, also thank you to Fabi, the NRF, and the MPPI CFBE lab. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That was a very good presentation. Well done. Oh, just to get going before I answer, uh, before I pick up on the question, is this PhD or master's level? This was a honors project. Okay. Okay. So how was it like in terms of molecular? I have a bit of experience. It can be very tedious. Can you just share a bit of the experience with us, how you went about uh, it? It was, so the grower plants was, they were quite challenging to work with in the beginning. Um, like we couldn't get the DNA out. So it was quite a struggle, but eventually we got it, we got it working. Okay, so the process is optimized now. You can easily apply it. Yeah. Is it customized for this plant or it can be applied to other plants? We had to customize it a little bit for Graham. Okay, okay. I have one question from one of the uh, participants. They said the use of at least two backholding sequence, more often RBCL and MATK is strongly recommended for discrimination at species level. Why was ITS. Why was why did you use only ITS? Was there any specific reason for that? 
Yes, so um, we use the ITS firstly and mostly because it is a, um, a nuclear gene, so so that we could see if there's um, hybrids, which we wouldn't be able to see with a chloroplast marker. But um, and also we, because it was an honors project, we couldn't do all of the barcoding genes. We did briefly have a look at one and some of the samples, um, but yeah, the main reason was because it's we needed a nuclear gene and because of the time constraints. And also the other barcoding genes um, didn't have um, single nucleotide polymorphisms that differed between all three species. So the ITS um, was the easiest, quickest one to use. Okay, no, thank you very much. I'm more interested in the pharmacological assays. That's my area of expertise. In terms of the leaves, uh, depending on the physiological state, you might have different activity. So can you just describe to me what level of the leaves did you use? Were they the younger ones or the old ones? Also, um, what influenced your choice? Was there any yeah. specific reason? Okay, thank you, yeah. So we um, did a mixture of younger and older leaves, um, again, because of um, time constraints. So, um, and we also used leaves that were, it was uh, just before autumn. So they were quite, they were still green and um, healthy looking leaves. Okay. Okay, so I'm sure, are you taking this up for your master's? Yes. Okay, no, all the best with your research and there is quite a lot you can still do. Yes. Thank okay, you. I have one question here also. How does environmental condition affect the cultivated white flower? Is there any genetic variation between the flower growing in Pictoria and the other location? This is from Prof Manmo. Uh, yes, thank you, Prof. So um, the plants, we couldn't really compare the growth of the plants in cultivation with the ones in the wild because um, the ones in the wild were much older. So the ones in cultivation were all much younger plants, but it doesn't seem like the abolishment of pigment um, influences its ability to survive and thrive. It, the plants look very healthy, the young ones. Okay. Um, Prof. Sandra is commending you that doing this at honors level is very good. Uh, this from Prof. Sandra. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. I think we are doing very well with time. Thank you so much and wishing you all the best for your master's and hopefully PhD and subsequent studies. Thank you so much, Ms. Bota. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you so much and thanks for the participation by the audience. Now we are going to the next speaker, who is our fourth speaker in this ethnobotany section. I'll call her Umbali. Umbali is from University of Johannesburg. She will be presenting a project for us. Is Umbali on stage? Chiwa, okay, Bali, welcome. I hope your slide is ready. Yes, I'm trying to share. Okay, so you'll be talking to us about uh, an important genus in the Asteraceae family. You'll be looking at the ethnobotany and taxonomy. I guess you are from University of Johannesburg, right? Yes. The floor is yours. You've got 15 minutes. Okay. Uh, we're still waiting for the slide. Yes, it's up and running. Bali, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Greetings all. My name is Mishan Balichira. I'm from the University of Johannesburg. I'm here to talk about the ethnobotany, taxonomy, and analysis genus Plafostachis. My supervisor is Professor Ben Eric van Weg, co-supervisors Professor Patricia M. Tilney and Dr. Nicola G. Berg. The aims of my study were to review the ethnobotany and taxonomy of the genus Plachostachis, study the stem and leaf anatomy of Plachostachis, and also study and compare the stem 
anatomy of the genus Tenrinea with that of Plechostachis, using anazectone as an out group, since there is a suggestion that Tenrinea should be included in Plechostachis. Plechostachis is a genus of two species, namely Plechostachis parifolia and Plechostachis. This genus is this it is endemic to the southern parts of Africa. The generic name was derived from a Greek word, Plekin, meaning twist, which refers to which refers to this um, untidy twisted growth habit. Species species of the distinguished by their single growth and their small sessious leaves. Plachastachis separifolia is commonly known as quaity, faulty, copper bush. Or koi hood. These species flat generalized in the Southern California. Placosta is typically poorly known, yet appears to be an important species reported to have a pleasant smell. Placosta is polyphonia, grows along stream banks and on forest margins. No comprehensive study has been. These are the mega essential oil compounds in Plechostachis. The two, the two studies, Tekka and Bello, 1996 and in 1996 and Hinana, as also the main, showed different main compound, showed different main compound. This may be due to. So this is something that needs further investigation. Data indicate that to a monotypic tenrin. genus is one species called tenrin. Yeah. According to an unpublished data on a herbarium label, this species is used as tea. In the above, anazectone was as an art group, specifically the asperum species. The synthetic literature was achieved through consultation of various references from published books and journal articles obtained on international online dating. Specimens in the niche were also examined for further in morphological characteristics. Present in this table are anatomical sample studies. Nine material were preserved in buffer FAA. Small portions of the stem and leaf were cut as illustrated in this picture, dehydrated in a series of alcohol, infiltrated with GMA, embedded in capsules, and polymerized. With the use of an ultra microtome, sections were made, stained with sheaves reagent or tiled in blue, mounted, and also viewed under an Olympus compound. Compound microscope and also photographed using an Olympus digital camera. Presented on this table are the stem and leaf morphology of Plastachis polyfolia, Plastachis polyfolia, and Tenrinea filicifolia. Looking at the table, the stems seem to be to the stem seems to have um, similar morphological characters for all the three species. However, the leaves margins and shape seem to be different. Placosta, the leaves of Placostachis sepalifolia are circular in shape and have margins, whereas Placostachis polyfolia have obvious shape, have leaves that have obvious shape and are flattened margins, and Tendronia falsifolia have uh, leaves that have flat in shape and have an entire margin. Placostachis polyfolia is used as a bedding material by the indigenous people, it is used as tea by the cave people. The tea has anti inflammatory and omelion properties. This species is also used to treat various respiratory ailments. This is the sample the tree the outcome of the stuff is in Tanzania and 
There's nothing on the slides if the comparison of the stem and leaf anatomy of the Andrea populations, which includes Frascob and Quebec. Looking at looking at stem transverse section of the stem transverse section. that the epidermal cells are break in the shape and the adjacent layers, cortex layers, and various substance. Looking at the sections and on all the locality, the shape is conspicuously raised below and grouped above. This slide presents the stem comparison of the general there are few, there are few outside papillus epidermal cell on all the genera. Looking at the cortex layers, Plachostachis and anasectum have few cortex layers, whereas Tendrinia has few more layers. As mentioned above, the, the outer layers of the Tendrinia contain tendiniferous content. On all the genera, the piece the piece is composed of sclerenchyma, of sclerenchyma cells. This slide presents the leaf midrib comparison of the genera Plachostachis, Tendronia, and Anosectum. The, the shape of the midrib is similar in Plachostachis and Tendronia, but different in Anosectum in that in Plachostachis and Tendronia, the shape of the midrib is conspicuously raised below and grooved above, whereas in Anosectum, the shape is conspicuously raised below but curved above. Looking at the epidermal cells at the epidermis at the epidermal cells at the epixal site, in anaxectum they are very bigger. Plachostachis and tendronia they are smaller. The distinctive sclerenchyma cap is present in plachostachis and tendronia, but absent in anaxectum. Looking at the palisade cells at the ed exile site, the in the endosectome they 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 extend across the midrib, whereas in in, in tendronia and plachostachis they are disturbed. Presented on this slide is the on this slide is the leaf lamina comparison of the general plachostachis, tendronia, and anosectum. Looking at the epidermal cells. Looking at the epidermal cells at the ed exile site, anosectum have bigger, have larger um, epidermal cells compared to plachostachis and tendronia. Plachostachis and anosectum have one layer of the palisade, of, of the palisade, whereas tendronia has two or three palisade layers. The mesophile cells adjacent to the lower epidermis seems to be slightly elongated for it for tendronia and plachostachis in and plachostachis but more or less as a diametric in anosectum following is the decrotomous key for plachostachis suborbicular leaves with crisp undulate margins and inner involucral backs with conspicuously milky white tips ex exceeding flower plachostachis a parifolia Upper flat margins and the inner involucrally back bracket, small dirty tips about equaling the leaves, identify Plachostachis polyfolia. In conclusion, species can be recognized by their tangled growth and small siliceous leaves. The ethnobotanic information is only available for Plachostachis polyfolia. The stem anatomy showed few potential anatomical useful characters. The midrib and lamina showed several potential useful taxonomic characters. Therefore, anatomical, anatomical characters support the close relationship between Plachostachis and Tenrinia. Future studies should focus on the anatomy, essential oil chemistry, and ethnobotany of the entire group, including Plachostachis polyfolia and Tenrinia falsifolia. Grateful acknowledgments to my supervisor, Professor Ben and Eric Van Veek, co-supervisors, Professor Patricia M. Tilney, Dr. Nicola 
Jiberg, Miranda Kukumo for instance, when during my visit at the herbarium, Mr. Kumo Moraro with assistance with as, by assist, assisting me with the um, references, sorry. Um, and for, uh, thank you to the NRF and the university for financial assistance. Thank you. Chimbali, thank you so much. I think this area is one of the most neglected area and there is very few experts when it comes to taxonomy globally. So you are, you are on the right track. I hope you stay there. Okay. <laughs> So, is it the Bachelor's or PhD? Sorry? Is this at master's level or PhD level, your study? Not a master's level. Oh, okay, because I see you have a lot of work you are projecting for the future. Is it part of what you are going to be doing for your PhD? No, the I'm still study. continuing. Oh, no, okay. I Okay, I just want to ask, while I'm waiting for the audience to give us more questions, what's your experience so far? What have you enjoyed most and what have you enjoyed the least in this journey? Um, what I've enjoyed the most is knowing that, um, is learning about the ethnobotany of, um, of course, plants, because I've been very interested on that. And the least, I don't know what you say this is. Nothing so far. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I have a question. I was expecting Prof Motete to ask a question and she, she just did. Will you be doing some histochemistry? That's the question from Prof Motete about your research. Will you be including histochemistry as part yes, of this? Yes, I matter? will. Yes, I will. Okay. Is this your first year or second year? First year. Okay, so there's still a lot, a long way for you to go. Um, in terms of the ethnobotanical uses, where do you find the plant and why are you not trying to get information from the local people, what they use the plant for? Because you mentioned that it's just one that have uses. Is that not part of your research? Yes, it is part of my research. So I'll try and discuss that with my supervisor oh okay because it's actually very valuable as your supervisor presented yesterday those information are there with the people and if we don't document it it's it gonna get lost you understand over time so if there is possibility for you to do that you need to actually document it as part of your study because it's going to be credited to the people once you publish the research uh, another question from Prof. Anna. She's asking that, do you think the age of the plant is important when it comes to anatomy? Yes, I think it is, especially when you're looking. When, can I share my slides again? Uh, I think you still have permission. You can do that. If not, the technical okay. people will help us. I will just answer yes. Looking at the stem. The stems of the stems that were compared between um, Placostachis and that of um, Tenrenia were different in age. Um, the Placostachis stems that were used were younger than those of the Tenrenia um, stems. So that's why we couldn't find more taxonomically useful characters. So I think the age does have a impact. Oh, okay. But will you consider that as part of your research or? Is there a plan? Um, try. Maybe not. You discuss that with your supervisor. It's fine. I have yeah. one question here again. Now, what will you, uh, in a very uh, short sentence, what's the significance of this study? How does it contribute to human? What's the take home? Or what do you want to feel fulfilled at the end of this study? What's the significance? Um. As to show that Plechostach um, as well is important since it is very, um, since it is scientifically known. But, okay, I... but sorry, but have um, like uh, ethnobotanical um, uses. Okay, I think one other 
aspect you also need to know is that in terms of quality control, it's very important. Once you have those kind of, an, uh, uh, those type of method to actually identify plants, it's very good for quality control aspect. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, okay, thank Bali. You. Uh, thank you I think uh, all the best with your study and best wishes. Keep well. Thank you. Yes. So thank you so much to the audience and thank you for the interactive section. We are going to the next speaker. I think we are doing very well with the time. We're actually about five minutes ahead of time. I'll be, I'm not sure, is the cook available? She's supposed to present on. Hi, yes, um, I'm, yeah. Okay, thanks. I think you came on board. Thank you so much. So you've got 15 minutes to present and we have five minutes to interact with you. You are from University of Victoria, being supervised by the Professor Lamri Talao. So can you tell us how to inhibit skin cancer growth and proliferation? We look forward to your presentation. The floor thank is you yours. so much. Um, thank you. As you mentioned, my the topic of my presentation is capsicum extracts with the potential to inhibit skin cancer growth and proliferation. Um, with my main supervisor being Prof. Namrit Sadal and my co-supervisor being Dr. Danielle Twedi. So chilies are consumed on a daily basis by 25% of the world's population and capsaicinoids are the pungent compounds found in chilies that are associated with the burning sensation. So um, capsaicin is the most abundant capsaicinoid found in chilies and it has been tested against various cancerous cell lines such as throat cancer, blood cancer, lung cancer and bladder cancer. And throughout this presentation, I will discuss the aim of my project as well as all the methods used to reach my conclusion. Um, please be advised that this slide contains graphic images that might be upsetting to some. So melanoma is the 19th most common cancer in the world with 300,000 new cases having been reported in 2018. And in South Africa, between the years of 2005 and 2013, 11,784 new cases were reported. And the main environmental risk factor to consider for the development of melanoma skin cancer is solar radiation. And in the UK, it is estimated that 90% of male and 86% of female melanoma cases can be attributed to um, solar radiation. So, Type B UV radiation is genotoxic and is absorbed by the skin cells and causes direct DNA damage in the form of CPDs and 6,4 photo products, which are covalent linkages that form between um, consecutive bases along the, I'm oh, sorry, um, covalent linkages that form between consecutive bases. This disrupts the double helix shape of um, the DNA and inhibits um, DNA replication as well as mRNA transcription. Uh, type A UV radiation causes indirect DNA damage through the induction of reactive oxygen species. So melanoma is the result of melanocytes mutating and proliferating abnormally. And usually it starts as a mole that transforms into a dysplastic nevus. Um, after this, there are two distinct growth phases that can be observed, the radial growth phase and the vertical growth phase. During the radial growth phase, cells proliferate intraepidermally and become cancerous. And during the vertical growth phase, um, an invasive nodule forms and cells can spread to the lymphatic system as well as blood vessels and start to metastasize. So to prevent hypoxia and starvation induced by this uncontrolled growth, the cancerous cells start to secrete growth factors such as vascular endothelial growth factor, placental growth factor, and um, fibroblast growth factor beta. And this forms, the, this allows the tumor to form its own vascular network. 
So melanoma has a very high metastatic potential and this significantly influences the survival rate of patients. And if melanoma is caught early, it has a five-year survival rate of more than 98%. However, if it has started to metastasize, this drops to below 25%. So there are five main capsaicinoids that can be found in the capsicum genus. Of these, capsaicin and dihydrocapsaicin are the only ones that have been previously tested against melanoma cancer. And they were found to have IC50 values of 90 micromolar and 117 micromolar respectively. The hypothesis for this um, project was that the extracts prepared from the fruits of the capsicum plants and the pure compounds would inhibit melanoma cell proliferation growth and as well as the production of melanotransferrin. The research questions were whether extracts and capsaicinoids would inhibit melanoma cell proliferation and whether extracts and capsaicinoids would inhibit the production of melanotransferrin in melanoma cells. So the aims of the study were to determine whether capsicum extracts and capsaicinoids show anti-proliferative activity against the A375 melanoma cell line in vitro, as well as the effect of um, the extracts and capsaicinoids on the production of melanotransferrin in the A375 melanoma cell line. So extracts were prepared from the fruits of um, cultivars from five, the five main capsicum species that are cultivated worldwide. So the capsicum genus originated in Central and South America. And from there, it was spread around the world by spice traders. The, and the, plot, the plants became naturalized in their new environments. And from then on, well, at this time, there are over 50,000 recognized cultivars that originated only from these, the five main cultivated species. So these are all the cultivars from the five main species that we use to um, prepare extracts. And then these are just some examples of the cultivars used. So the fruit from the capsicum plants were blended with 99% ethanol and for the extraction process. And after they were rotary evaporated, um, some of them left a residue behind in the flasks. The, this residue was only water soluble. So we rinsed them off with um, autoclaved and distilled water. After that, all the extracts were freeze dried and then stored. These are some of the extracts that we prepared. So a quantitative TLC was done to determine whether the capsaicinoids, capsaicin, dihydrocapsaicin, and nor dihydrocapsaicin were present in the extracts that were prepared. And as a solvent system, we used hexane and ethyl acetate in a one-to-one -one ratio. So none of the water extracts showed any presence for capsaicinoids. Um, this was expected, however, because capsaicinoids are poorly soluble in water. Um, extracts that did show the presence of capsaicinoids include clara red, the scotch bonnet, chiltepin, habanero, yellow cherry, the red boot julokia, and mayhem cultivars, of which the habanero had the highest concentration. Um, capsaicinoids, the three capsaicinoids, however, were also indistinguishable from one another due to their similarities in molecular weight. An in vitro anti-proliferative anti assay was done to determine whether um, the extracts and capsaicinoids showed anti-proliferative activity against um, the A375 melanoma cell line, and as well or also to determine whether the capsaicinoids and extracts would be toxic towards the HACAT cell line, which is a normal human keratinocyte cell line. So extracts, none of the extracts showed IC50 values of less than 400 micrograms per mole. 
However, the capsicum anum serrano, the capsicum frutescens mayhem, and capsicum anum jalapeno did show inhibition um, of 13%, 4%, and 21% respectively at 400 micrograms per mole. And they showed no toxicity towards the normal human keratinocyte cell lines at 400 micrograms per mole. The capsaicinoids, however, showed anti-proliferative activity in both the melanoma cell line and toxicity towards the human keratinocyte cell line as well. So dihydrocapsaicin showed the lowest IC50 value, followed by capsaicin and nordihydrocapsaicin. Um, a lower, lower IC50 values were found for or were observed for the HACAT cell line compared to A375 resulting in selectivity index values of less than one. Um, dihydrocapsaicin, however, had the highest selectivity index value of 0.99. So melanotransferrin is a transferrin homologue that um, has been shown to increase angiogenesis and influence cell proliferation and um, cell migration. The mechanism through which this occurs is not known, um, but it has been shown that if mel uh, the expression of melanotransferrin is inhibited, that lung metastasis of um, melanoma in murine models decreases fivefold. So for the inhibition of melan melanotransferrin production, Cells were treated with the three extracts that showed inhibitory activity, as well as the three capsaicinoids. And afterwards, supernatant was collected and an ELISA kit was used to determine whether the um, production of melanotransferrin was inhibited or in any way affected by these, the extracts and the capsaicinoids. So the capsicum extracts increased the production of melanotransferrin in a non-significant manner, while the capsaicinoids, all, all three of the capsaicinoids showed um, reduced production of melanotransferrin at uh, different concentrations. So capsaicinoids did inhibit the melanoma cell proliferation, and they also inhibited the production of melanotransferrin. The decreased cell proliferation correlated with a decreased production of melanotransferrin. Extracts, however, did not influence melanoma cell proliferation or the melanotransferrin production. This supports what was found in previously reviewed literature where capsaicinoids did show inhibition towards melanoma growth and proliferation. However, um, extracts sh were shown to exacerbate or worsen melanoma growth. In the future, we would recommend that a different extraction method also be tried out. Um, we had a lower yield of capsaicinoids in our extracts than expected and other um, commercially accepted um, extraction methods should be considered such as oil extractions or supercritical CO2 extractions. And based on the results, all three capsaicinoids should be further investigated for their anti-angiogenic anti and anti-metastatic potential. Um, we also think that it would be wise to look into non-pungent synthetic analogs as um, capsaicinoids are known irritants to the skin. So for future applications and yeah, for future studies, we would recommend that non-pungent non synthetic analogs also be studied further and considered. Um, so the inhibition of melanotransferrin also could potentially have applications for diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and arthritis. Um, I would just like to acknowledge all the help that I've received throughout the year. And um, yeah, I would like to express my deepest appreciation to Professor Namrita Lal and Dr. Danielle Twilley for their unrelenting guidance and limitless support. I would also like to acknowledge the assistance I received from my fellow students and colleagues in the Department of Plant and Soil Sciences, with a special thanks to Mr. Jason Sampson for sharing his wealth 
of knowledge on all things chili with me. A special thanks to Mr. Sean Freeman and Living Seeds for um, providing all the plant material that was used during the while during this project. And I would also like to acknowledge the financial support that the NRF provided. Um, thank you. Uh, these are my references. Ms. DeCock, uh, for the excellent presentation. Is this at master's or PhD level, this research? Um, it's an honors project. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, we have so much honors project from Prof. Lamitra's lab. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What's your experience so far? What did you enjoy the most while doing the research? I know it's a semester, right? Uh, so, yeah, it's only a year project, So, but I will be continuing with some of the research into masters. Um, I think the part I liked the most about doing this project and the part I liked the least as well was um, working with cell cultures. I find it very interesting, but they can be a bit temperamental sometimes. So it can make matters a bit difficult. And yeah, I think, yeah. How did you deal with contamination? How many contamination did you have? Um, luckily, I didn't have a lot of contamination. I think I only had contamination once or twice. Um, and it was luckily not in my um, plates, but in the um, flasks. So I would rather just I threw out the flasks and started from the, from scratch again. But yeah, as I said, I only I had contamination the first time I plated or the first time I defrosted my cells. And then after that, I only had contamination once. Okay, no, I've got a question from the audience. That's uh, from literature, most small molecules, there is this limitation about low solubility. They are not specific in body fluid. They have short life. The availability is very low and they have this strong burning sensation. Did you observe any of this in your research and how have you addressed it? That's the question from one of the audience. Um, I don't, we didn't specifically, I think, look at that. It was more just, so um, for, we saw, uh, sorry. We didn't really look at the solubility in body fluids. Like I said, we only really worked in cell cultures. And um, I think in the future, it could be helpful to look at something like nanoparticles to give it a longer um, lifespan, I guess, in the um, body or, and to prevent them from binding to other things or things they're not supposed to buy into or I don't know I hope that answers the question yeah yeah actually that was what I wanted to suggest I know Bianca is presenting after you and you're in the same lab and she's talking about nanoparticles that perhaps this might help this limitation about the solubility and other aspects which are known associated with these small molecules so I'm wishing yes. you all the best for your masters and I can't see any other question um Thanks for sharing okay. your research finding with us. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Have a nice day. Okay. So thank you very much. And thank you to the participant who posted this question. We are doing very well with time. I think we're about eight minutes early. So we might finish before 3 p.m. Uh, I will just go to the next speaker, who is also from the... Bianca will be talking to us about the antimicrobacterium effect of encapsulated poly poly nanoparticles on microbacterium tuberculosis. Bianca, the floor is yours. This is also from University of Victoria. You've got 15 minutes and we'll okay. engage you in Thank five you minutes so for questions. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me? Hi. We can hear you, Bianca. Great. Sorry, I just wanted okay. to. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So the following study was about the antimicrobacterial effect of encapsulated polyherbal PLGA nanoparticles.
Tuberculosis is a highly infectious disease which can attack any body part. However, it's found to predominantly attack the lungs. Globally, the 30 high TB burden countries are mutually responsible for 87% of TB occurrences. South Africa contributes to about 3%. And after correcting for its population size, South Africa can be classified with one of the highest TB incidence rates. Medicinal plants have been utilized traditionally for centuries. Five medicinal plants native to South Africa were selected due to their cultural significance and traditional use for respiratory illnesses such as TB. These plants have been included in several ethnopharmacological studies aimed at validating their indigenous claims for bioactivity and is why it was chosen to be included in the polyherbal. Due to the previously reported activity of these plants against MTB, PLGA nanoparticle formulations of these plants were investigated as a potential anti-TB drug delivery system. Plants were used to be encapsulated within the PLGA. These can be great additives to the existing treatments as an adjuvant. PLGA is a material which has been FDA approved and has shown to have a promising polymeric encapsulating material as its various benefits outweighs its limited and avoidable disadvantages by cross-linking and copolymerization. PLGAs has also shown to be taken up by macrophages and dendritic cells, which are the main targets during infection with MTB. This short clip shows macrophages engulfing foreign cells during phagocytosis, as can be seen here. Nanoparticles are engulfed into uh, macrophages in a similar manner. The hypothesis of this study is that the encapsulating these plants in PLGA nanoparticles will improve the antimicrobial activity and reduce the cytotoxicity, promoting their potential use as adjuvants in TB therapy. The research questions that this study was trying to answer was whether the polyherbal of the ethanolic plant extracts possesses an antimicrobial activity and if PLGA encapsulation affects the antimicrobial activity and cytotoxicity. To reach the aims and objectives of this study, the polyherbal was prepared by weighing off the five ethanolic extracts of each plant sample in a one-to-one -one ratio for each respective experiment. PLGA nanoparticles were formulated, after which the formed nanoparticles were characterized. Lastly, in vitro studies were done using the nanoparticles and the ethanolic plant extracts. PLGA nanoparticles were prepared via a solvent displacement technique, which is uh, with the ethanolic plant extracts used as the targeting ligands and PLGA as the encapsulating material. Thereafter, the characterization of the nanoparticles were done to investigate the stability and reproducibility of these formed PLGA nanoparticles by measuring their physiochemical properties, um, such as particle size, polydispersity index, surface charge, functional groups present, thermal stability, crystalline structure, as well as calculating the drug loading um, content and encapsulation efficiency. Nanoparticles are sub-micron-sized colloidal particles less than 1,000 nanometers in diameter. Spodemnocarpus burens had the best physiochemical properties as it had a, poly, uh, a diameter less than 300 nanometers, a polydispersity index of less than 0 0.3, and a zeta potential of about minus 15 millivolts. Larger zeta potential values are about of about 30 millivolts are preferred as it is more likely to be stable over time. The polyherbal also showed good physiochemical properties. The difference in the physiochemical properties between the nanoparticles can be due to the chemical makeup of the encapsulated ethanolic plant extracts, which can also more specifically be due to the plant part which was used. To reveal the functional groups and possible interactions of the ethanolic plant extracts and the polymer in the nanoparticles, FDIR was performed. When looking at FDIR um, of the PLGA nanoparticles, it is clear that the functional groups of both the polyherbal and PLGA itself is present. Some functional groups, however, is less intensively present or some not present at all. 
UV-Vis spectroscopy links with FDIR as the UV-Vis is used to determine the drug loading content and encapsulation efficiency of the ethanolic plant extracts within the PLGA nanoparticles. The drug loading content of the nanoparticles varied between 6 and 10 percent, and the entrapment efficiency ranged from 51 to 79 percent. Salvia Aria showed the most favorable encapsulation percentage of 79.3 percent, and Spadimna Carpus Virens showed the most favorable drug loading content of 10 percent. The drug loading content and entrapment efficiency percentages of all PLGA nanoparticles were satisfactory considering that the ethanolic plant extracts used in this study tend to be water-soluble. <clears throat> PLGA nanoparticles has shown to have limited potential to encapsulate hydrophilic compounds. XRD was used to determine the crystalline structure of the PLGA nanoparticles, and as expected, the XRD patterns of the PLGA nanoparticles showed no distinct peaks, except for a glass transition state at 45 degrees which indicates that the nanoparticles existed mostly in an amorphous state. The thermal stability of the nanoparticles was determined by monitoring the weight loss over time with increasing temperature. The most prominent decrease in weight at 318 degrees Celsius is most likely due to the loss of the organic compounds through combustion and degradation of PLGA. For all in vitro studies, 12 samples were tested five ethanolic plant extracts, the polyherbal, and, PL and the PLGA nanoformulations prepared from the ethanolic extracts. The antimycobacterial activity on Mycobacterium stigmatis of all samples were investigated using a mycotiter Alma Blue assay method. Presto Blue was used as a cell viability indicator, pink showing viable cell growth and blue indicating inhibition. The antimycobacterial results on M. smegmatis revealed that the minimum inhibitory concentration of salvia aria was 500, whereas all the other four plant extracts, the polyherbal, as well as the nanoparticles MIC values, were equal to or in excess of 1,000. In general, a plant extract with the MIC value of equal to or greater than 1,000 micrograms per milliliter is considered to be poorly effective due to the relatively large volume of plant material which will have to be ingested in an attempt to elicit a biological response. The cytotoxicity analysis of the samples were tested on the human embryonic kidney cell line. The HEC293 cell line has been utilized broadly as a model cell in nanoparticle toxicity studies. Once again, Presto Blue was used as a cell viability indicator. For the ethical viability of medicinal plants as a therapeutic intervention in human populations, studies to determine the cytotoxicity of various plant samples are necessary. The IC50s showed that the polyherbal and salvia aria was highly cytotoxic. Lepia scabarima and spadimnocarpus purines moderately cytotoxic, and euclea natalensis and valeria repens faintly cytotoxic. By nano-encapsulating the ethanolic plant extracts, there seems to be a notable reduction in cytotoxicity on the HEC293 cells. As for example, the polyherbal, which was highly cytotoxic with the IC50 of about 10, showed a prominent decrease in, in the cytotoxicity after it was encapsulated by PLGA with the IC50 of over 400. All PLGA nanoparticle formulations decrease the renal cytotoxicity on the HEC293 cells, as they all had an IC50 much larger than 100 micrograms per milliliter. This could be due to the need for various endocytic pathways to induce the release of the encapsulated plant samples and the controlled drug release. This study showed that PLGA nanoparticles are promising encapsulating material in the fact that it reduces the cytotoxicity in this study considerably. However, more cytotoxicity tests needs to be done to ensure that this is the case for all cells involved in the absorption of the nanoparticles. More tests are also required um, to be able to conclude whether PLGA nanoparticles will, be, um, will have activity on MTB. In this study, a preliminary antimycobacterial assay was done on Mycobacterium smegmatis, a non-pathogenic bacteria in the Mycobacterium family, and did not show activity at the highest tested concentration. Future, 
Future studies should examine the cytotoxic effect of the nanoparticles on cells which corresponds to the route of exposure to the nanoparticles. Tests and, um, for the activity of the nanoparticles against MTB, drug release studies, time stability studies, as well as mechanistic studies using the nanoparticles. First and foremost, I'm grateful for my supervisor, Prof. Namarita Lal, and my co-supervisors, Dr. Anna Marie Reed and Rusani Mandewana at the CSIR for their invaluable advice, continuous support, and patience during my honor study. I would also like to thank the University of Pretoria and the CSIR for their access to the resources and lab facilities and the NRF for funding. And I would also like to give a special thanks to my colleagues for supporting me throughout the study. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Presentation, which was very informative, especially when we look at TB incident in South Africa, it's one of the biggest health challenges. So yes. I think your work is very relevant. Um, keep up the Thank good work. You. At what Thank level you. is this study? Honest level. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just yeah. like the previous, the cock, just like the cock, right? Yeah. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> no, that's very good. So tell me, in terms of the ethnobotanical uses of this plant, mm -hmm. uh, do you have clear evidence that they are using it for TB related incidents among the local communities? And why the combination? Why five plants? Why not two? Yes. Why not one and uh, three? So um, that's actually a very good question. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yes, there has been evidence for them using it um, specifically for TB or other respiratory illnesses. And like I mentioned, when I listed all of my plants, that it has been uh, these five plants that I chose specifically um, in has been in ethnopharmacological studies trying to prove their um, respiratory um, help, if I can say it in that way, um, especially in Prof. Lol's group herself. Um, a lot of those plants are individually being tested by a lot of her students. The reason for five plants is that most polyherbals that Prof. Lol has tested has about a maximum of four plants, um, but we chose to try the five plants because all five of those plants have different mechanisms of actions against MTE. So we wanted to see if we use all of them together, if they will maybe enhance each other, if they will suppress each, other, each other's mechanisms. Um, and then also encapsulating them was the, the idea by encapsulating them was also because obviously if you have one plant which is cytotoxic mixing all five of them together it will increase cytotoxicity so we wanted to see that if nano encapsulating will it take away the activity of these plants as well um and what will it do to the cytotoxicity um will it help it will it reduce it <laughs> Okay. No, thank you so much, Bianca, for the response. Yes, I'm satisfied. Uh, I think there is a question from a participant. Let me just go there. Yes, the question is also from Prof. Motete, University of Johannesburg, that are these plants only used for TB or other respiratory tract infection? Are they only used for TB? No, no. Most of these plants are mostly used for respiratory illnesses. So that's why we chose to also test them against MT. Okay. I'm sure that has responded to Prof. Motete correctly. Uh, let me just ask you another question. What have you enjoyed so far? And what did you enjoy the least <laughs> in this journey? <laughs> so um, something that I really enjoyed was the nano encapsulating process. Um, what I did not enjoy was the machines breaking on me and not working when I needed them to, um, <laughs> especially freeze dryers. But it actually made me um, just realize how patient you have to be in research. Oh, true, true. So we expect to see you come back for your master's and possibly PhD? I think so. <laughs> OK, no. We need more people because there is a lot to do and the more people, the better, yeah.
And I think another aspect, I, I'm sure your supervisor is doing it, is the uh, active collaboration with this knowledge holder who owns this knowledge, which is related to what Prof. Ben spoke about yesterday. Do you have anything to say along that line? In terms of your finding, is there any plan to share it with them and things like that? Um, I am a bit confused by the question. Sorry, can you repeat it? In terms of uh, the findings, yes. perhaps the question is meant for your supervisor. Are there ongoing <laughs> plans to yeah. share these results mm -hmm. with the knowledge holders on the long run? Because this knowledge is from a particular community group of people. Yes, that, yes. Yeah. yes, I understand. I think, I think so. I do think that um, Prof. Lal does include the knowledge holders and does reach out and even asks, I know that we have to ask permission um, if we want to use certain plants in certain communities as well. Okay. No, thank you so much, Bianca. I can't thank see you. any other question and all the best with your masters, okay? Thank Hope you so to much. see you next year presenting your masters research <laughs> during you. summer. Okay, thanks. Thank you, bye. So, bye. Thank you so much uh, to the audience. I think this is the end of the first section on ethnobotany. We had six presenter, which was dominated by University of Victoria. We had one presenter from Northwest and one from University of Johannesburg. I think given the uh, results shared so far, there is a great future for ethnobotany in South Africa if this type of study can be done at almost level. So we are optimistic that we have a great future ahead of us. And I would just like to thank all the presenter. I know it takes a lot of energy to prepare and to present. And please keep up the good work. And we look forward to more engagement in future with you and your supervisors. At the moment, I think the next section is starting by 3.30. And we'll look forward to you to attend so that you can actually support those who will be presenting their poster presentation during the next section. I will give the mic back to the uh, organizer. And thank you to everyone for participating.